So let's now go into the jhana, the four jhanas. So this next section is really around the process that the bodhisattva uses to enter into jhana. And then builds on what we've just been through with, with skilled thoughts as opposed to unskilled thoughts. And what we'll read out is really that this is the standard method that you see across many, many suttas. Now, we'll begin with the first paragraph, which says, tireless energy was aroused in me. So this is the bodhisattva. And unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. So aradang ko paname bikawe viriyang ahosi asalinang apita apatita sati asamutta pasado kayo asarado samahitang chitang ekagang. So what that says is that there's active energy aroused by the bodhisattva. That's what we, we've read out in English and in Pali. And it's something that we probably cannot quite fathom. Like we talk about active energy and we go, yeah, we, we know what that means. But this is the Bodhisattva talking and we know he is about to enlighten. So the uh, quality that he he's using, this arada, is really this arada video that we know is a seeker quality. Arada video we know is active aroused energy, uh, being very energetic. So there's a firmness in his effort. There's no slacking off from the goal of Nibbana. And he's actively removing any unskilled states and developing and protecting his skilled states. That's what's encompassed in this first part. And you see that if you put your mind to the to what the Bodhi, un, unenlightened bodhisattva needs to do in order to perfectly enlighten all on his own and become the Buddha, you see, it must take a, a lot. And remember, on the night of this particular account, he his effort was so phenomenal. Uh, he meditated continuously without getting up from where he was sitting until he realized Nibbana. So his perseverance as part of that effort, that energy, was so great, was so vast, was so much. I mean, if you just think to yourself, could you imagine sitting there and saying, I'm not going to get up until I realize Nibbana? I, I'm, let alone just following in the Bodhisattva, the Buddha's footsteps. It's just, it's just amazing. You, you just wouldn't think, um, like for us, we would think, oh, maybe it's quite impossible, but it's such a feat that this this first part. And so the answer is that it's actually still hard for us to fathom and even harder for us to incline to what the Bodhisattva and the Noble Arahant have succeeded in. It's not impossible to do, but it's just that in our minds, it still feels like such a massive thing. And of course it is, but it's like, wow. So I think even a small contemplation of seeing it that way, just trying to get closer to the effort that the bodhisattva has, is very inspiring. It's an encouragement. Even if we have 1% of what the bodhisattva had on the night of his enlightenment, that I'm sure that would, would pack a whole punch that would probably fuel us for, for weeks and weeks and days and days and days. So clearly the bodhisattva had this un unremitting or unshaken mindfulness. You know, that was established for him. He had his active guard on duty that was in place and there was no, no room for him to have any sluggishness, forgetfulness, confusion, all those things that usually come, very similar to sloth and torpor, all that. None of that was there. Only clarity, lucidity and and sharp alertness i would say so as he removed as he moved through the jhanas his body became tranquil at ease and untroubled you know asarado means undisturbed undisturbed it could also mean cool so not warm or, or not excited so it's quite calm and quite contained and so then the bodhisattva goes on to explain the jhanas so we'll go bit by bit. I won't read out the whole lot. I'll, I'll go bit by bit. The first part is quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, 
which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. So this very much sounds like what we know of Adi Chitta Sikha, the higher training and concentration. All those component parts are there. You're secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, and then you go through the jhanas. Now, before we get into that, it's good to point out that if as part of your practice you cultivate generosity, cu cultivate virtue, then it also plays a part that is very helpful towards developing jhana. So if you've been generous, and you've kept good virtue by body, speech, and mind, that's a very good foundation for developing the mind. You need that. Otherwise, you get kicked out of jhana or you find it very difficult um, as a process of developing the mind because, you know, the, the misconduct is what needs to be purified. So putting that to one side, based on what we've read out, how do we actually attain to the first jhana based on that little description? So we start with Savitaka Savichara. So this is translated here as applied and sustained thought. So Vitaka can be translated as thinking, reflecting, initial application, and of course, this applied thought. It has the characteristic of fixity, so fixing to an object or something of that nature and steadying on it. And vichara, this is translated as investigation, examination, consideration, deliberation, or sustained application, as well as this sustained thought. So the characteristic for vichara is very much about movement. So for ease of explaining during this session, I think I'll simply use thinking and examining for vitaka and vichara. I find it easier just to use those terms. So the Pithakopadesa, the Pithaka disclosure is really good because it gives some similes to help us to understanding this process of Vitaka Vichara, thinking and examining. The first simile is, uh, is when we see someone coming towards us in the distance and we don't yet know whether it is a man or a woman. But when we get the perception that it is a man or a woman, they are of such a color or shape, they have that kind of thing, then our thinking is that that's thinking that's vitaka as we are thinking we then scrutinize a bit more we go back to the object and we try and figure out is this man or woman virtuous or unvirtuous are they rich or poor you know what are the other signs and features we can glean by examining so in thinking we fix on the object in examining we wander about the object that that object we fix on and, and turn it in our mind so that's that process it gives you an idea so thinking is the process of fixing on the object and approaching while examining is figuring out the signs and features of that fixed object. The second simile that the Pethakopadesa gives is just as when a winged bird first accumulates speed and after accumulating speed is able to glide. Thinking is like the accumulation of speed and examining is like the outstretched wings as the bird glides. So in this case, thinking has this momentum to it to achieve steadiness. So it, it gathers uh, momentum and then it steadies. Examining makes the most of that and then it moves, moves to like how a bird would glide. It just has that movement. So this second simile particularly resonates with the process of entering into the first jhana. So if we take our own example of contemplating the first noble truth, we can also see how thinking and examining or Vitaka Vichara works. So when we think that the Buddha has taught the first noble truth and that they have the 12 terms that begin with birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, and so on. This is the thinking. This is Vitaka. If we think about the first term, birth is suffering, and we uh, fix our mind to that, and then we start examining, we would go, how is birth suffering? And then what would come up is, Birth in hell is suffering. Birth in animal realm is suffering. Birth in the plane of departed is suffering and so on. So if we keep doing that, you can see that there is the thinking and examining happening, this initial and sustained thought. Likewise, you can also see it if you take an example, say, for example, our short meditation on, is it worth taking as me and mine? So we think about the instructions for the meditation, which is if it is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, is it worth taking as me and mine? That's the thinking. The exploring comes in when we contemplate what is impermanent. And then you consider, oh, the body is impermanent. 
or it could be the other aggregates are impermanent, then you realize it's unlasting. There is suffering. And then it, is it subject to change? Well, of course, the body ages, it ripens. So yes, it's subject to change. So yes, it is impermanent, suffering and subject to change. Therefore, it is not worth taking as me and mine. That's the contemplation. But you can see that vitaka vichara is happening. So if we take that contemplation further of coming back as a baby, the outcome is still the same when we do the vitaka vichara. Wrong view is being replaced with the right view, right intention. These thoughts are aligned with right view. So we have the thinking and examining in most of these teachings that the Buddha give, any of these um, sutta meditations that we do, they all help us, as we know, to enter into jhana. So that's that's good. That's the, We know how we do it. We know why we, we don't think there's too many problems with entering into jhana. So if we apply this to this sutta that we're looking at today, this the Veda, Vitaka Sutta, then the contemplation that the Bodhisattva used is also the same thinking and examining in order to develop the profitable path. He's thinking thoughts of renunciation, you know, fulfilling non-greed. And when he does that, he's secluded from sensual pleasure. He's thinking thoughts of non-ill will and fulfills non-hate. And then thinking thoughts of non-cruelty or the non-harm, and that fulfills the non-delusion. And so when you have the thoughts of non-ill will and non-cruelty, you're secluded from wholesome states. We are not giving any attention to unprofitable in that case. You're giving up the sensual desire thinking, the ill will thinking, the cruelty thinking. And you can see that the close examination of those kinds of thoughts is how the bodhisattva enters into jhana because he drops the unskilled and he's holding on to the skilled through the examination of that method. It's harmful. It doesn't aid wisdom or blocks wisdom. It causes difficulties, leads away from Nibbana. That's the examining of, of each of those thoughts through that process. He enters into jhana. So clearly you need skilled thoughts to overcome unskilled thoughts to enter into the first jhana. So here, what's really interesting is not about stopping all thoughts. So if you've been instructed before, just stop thinking. The Bodhisattva clearly has divided into two classes of thoughts at the beginning and valued one set of thoughts, which is the skilled thoughts, and is developing them and is getting rid of the other ones, the unskilled thoughts. Now, if you try to stop all thoughts, whether it's by asking your mind very nicely or by forcing it, the mind usually pushes back, it revolts, you know, and, and then the mind gets flooded with thoughts, usually of the um, unskillful type. And that's because you haven't, or well, we haven't established right view and right intention is not purified. So you can see if you simply follow the instructions of the Buddha, it's safer, it's easier. If you passively push the mind into thinking, just let go, relax, be peaceful, that actually can be quite obstructive because it leads you wrong path, wrong practice, wrong concentration, because you haven't done anything to actively pursue the non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion path. So you're likely to be rooted still in greed, hatred, and delusion. So you might still get to concentration, but because the right view hasn't been established, it's unlikely that it's noble right concentration that the Buddha is talking about. And if you use artificial keys, NLP, other tricks, you might also get some kind of concentration, but you haven't applied the Buddha's medicine, uh, the, these, these instructions. And so again, risk of wrong path, wrong practice, and, and still remaining bound to the world. You know, there won't be this liberation that the Buddha talks about. So this Deveda Vitaka Sutta highlights very well the Bodhisattva's experience and helps to clarify some of the misconceptions about different instructions that people give. What we really need to do is to make sure we skillfully direct the mind to the profitable path leading to the right view or leading with the right view. And it, then it really becomes the wisdom path that the Buddha speaks of. So if we've become successful with the bodhisattva's instruction, we are now secluded from sensual pleasures, unwholesome states, and we enter into the first jhana. We experience the rapture and happiness, the piti sukha, born of this seclusion. 
as the Bodhisattva says, whatever we frequently think and ponder upon, that will become the inclination of the mind. So in this case, we've been thinking and pondering on skilled states. So renunciation, non-ill will, non-cruelty. So we're inclining towards, towards all of that, inclining towards Nibbana. When we enter into the first jhana, we abandon five factors and we possess five other factors. So th this has been explained actually in Mahavedala Sutta. So that's Majjhimanakaya discourse number 43, as well as also in the Pethakopadesa. When Venerable Mahakotita asked Venerable Sariputta, friend, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana and how many factors are possessed? And Venerable Sariputta answers, friend, in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. And then he says, here, when a bhikkhu has entered into the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned, ill will is abandoned, sloth and torpor are, ab are abandoned, and restlessness and remorse are abandoned, and doubt is abandoned. And there occur applied thought, sustained thought, so this is the thinking and examining, rapture, pleasure, and unification of mind. This is how in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. So when we enter into the first jhana, we abandon the five hindrances. So those, if you remember from the Vija Sutta, are the nutriment for ignorance. So this is wonderful. We're no longer feeding ignorance, fueling ignorance. In the jhanas, we're actually um, unobstructed now. And so we're clearly cutting off what the Buddha calls the complete heap of wholesome. So Akusalarasi Sutta calls it Kevalo Akutalarasi, the complete heap of unwholesome. That's the five hindrances. And we possess these five characteristics of the first jhana. So this is the thinking, vitakka, uh, the examining, vichara, rapture, which is the piti, pleasure uh, or happiness is the sukha, and then the uh, chitta ekagata, which is the unification of the mind. So the question that is often asked is, how do we know that we have entered into the first jhana? And um, let's go through that. So when you're steadied in the skillful kind of thinking and examining, so this Vitaka Vichara, there's no longer any bodily or mental pain. That's the first thing that you notice. So of course, this is very helpful. All those aches and pains, sore knees, uh, different itches and, and all kinds of things that usually trouble us when we're not in jhana, they actually fade away. They no longer trouble us. Instead, what we get is the bodily mental pleasure, bodily and mental pleasure or happiness that arises. So this also, from that, um, you get the rapture. So how this is experienced is usually for, for different people, it's different things. So for some people is goosebumps or tingles all over the body. Sometimes it's uh, you feel some kind of rapture uh, flowing through the body. Um, something feels activated in the body. That's, that's really pleasant, really pleasing. It can also feel like the head is tingling and some kind of, of joy or rapture is flowing from the top of your head, like waves of rapture. Some people experience it as tears flowing. So even while you're in meditation, with the eyes closed, it doesn't necessarily break the meditation, but when you come out, you actually see or or feel all the tears. And when it happens like that, it feels like a real purification process. But the most obvious thing about the first jhana is that rapture and happiness are noticeable. So that's the first jhana. The second jhana, the Bodhisattva says, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, so this is Vitaka Vichara, Opsama, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. So what we see here is that we no longer need to cultivate any more thinking and examining. So this vitaka vichara is no longer needed. The mind is already inclined towards jhana. So there's a calming of that process. And in the case of the Bodhisattva, he was still very, very vigilant. He had made so much effort and was very active towards that at the beginning. So his mental development and inclination is probably a lot stronger than what we experience. In our case, we need to make sure that the effort we make as we uh, contemplate the early part of the meditation, like about the uh, 
being harmful, not wanting to block wisdom, um, not causing difficulties and not leaning to uh, Nibbana. When we look at unskillful thoughts, we need to make a very strong effort towards that to really firmly establish it. But in the case of the Bodhisattva, you can imagine that his he has certain parami and, and it's a lot more straightforward and more powerful than what we would do. So with the thought and examination, it's calm. And really, it's also calm because it's it's a very gross process. You know, it's not subtle. So for the second jhana concentration, there's more subtlety that enters. So when the when it said that there's a settling into inward serenity, and that comes with the confidence of being able to give up the thinking and examining, giving up the vitaka vichara, because you can see that you're deepening the one-pointedness, you're deepening the concentration. And so through that, the piti, the rapture comes to fulfillment. And rapture, what the Pedagogodesa says, is that the mental joy faculty is there. And when it comes to the sukha, the pleasure faculty is there. And then you get the concentration of the mind, the, the unification of the mind again, that, that's the samadhi. So the second jhana, it said, has four factors. It has the piti. It has the sukha, the happiness or pleasure. It has the unification of mind. So the same one-pointedness is still there, but you also have this self-confidence or inward serenity that, that is there. And that is because you're already experiencing concentration. And so you have this inward confidence that's there. So again, the question comes up, how do we know we've entered into the second jhana, concentration? And I think the most obvious answer is that in the second jhana, the strength of the rapture and pleasure is very evident. It's stronger than in the first jhana. It's more noticeable. And you, you get it without having to generate further skilled thoughts. So what you did at the beginning of the meditation, you no longer need to do. It's just you're reaping the results of, of the hard work that was done before. And the concentration in the mind feels firmer and a little bit more stable, if you will. So you you know that the mind is concentrated. Uh, one analogy that could be given is when you go from first jhana to second jhana, it's like riding a small wave. And then when you go across to the second jhana, you're jumping onto a bigger wave uh, without much effort. And, or maybe that wave is there and you just, your surfboard just, just goes uh, across to that wave. So the rapture then feels like it's pouring through the body. The body feels so happy and pleasurable, as does the mind. And this can last for a very long time, depending on how well you've laid the foundation for this meditation at the beginning. The difficulty comes in with the second uh, jhana concentration after, after a while, after some time, is that this rapture tires out the body. You know, Although it flows through the body, it's pleasurable, there's a joyful feeling, but it has a tiring effect. And it's really strange because it arises from all that rapture. So it's really strange in that way. But if you experience it many times, then you, you naturally want to go past that because you want something that's less tiring and more stable. So that's the second jhana. So with the third jhana, the Bodhisattva says, with the fading away as well of rapture, so pitti cha viraga, I abided in equanimity, so this is the upeka, and mindful and fully aware, so satisampajana, still feeling pleasure with the body, I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. So what happens with the third jhana is because of the difficulty with the second jhana, we want to let go of the rapture, the piti. Because we've understood that it's tiring and we want something better. And so we allow the rapture to subside. We no longer focus on it, give attention to it. So we still experience pleasure or happiness in the body. But now we're dwelling with the satisampajanya. And this is where the equanimity, the upeka, starts to come to fulfillment. And of course, the concentration is still there. The mind is still unified. So it said that this third jhana possesses five factors. So it has the sati, the mindfulness. It has the sampajana, which is the clear comprehension. It has the pleasure or happiness, sukha. 
It has this unification of mind, the chitta kagata, and it has this equanimity, so upeka. So the question, of course, is how do we know we've entered into the third jhana concentration? So even though rapture has ceased, this, this pithi had ceased, we still have pleasure or happiness. So the experience is actually better. It's better in that the body is no longer getting tired. We're no longer feeling like we're worn out. So the experience is more contained, if you will. The body feels more steady. So it's, it's experiencing the pleasure with steadiness. And while it experiences the pleasure, it feels so happy. The mind feels so happy. So if we use the same wave analogy, and just bear with me, these um, analogies I'm using, they're not perfect. But if you get off the big wave that we spoke of in the second jhana, and say you're experiencing so much happiness, riding just another wave without having to manage the peaks of the big wave. It's something like that. So the difficulty that we have arising out of the third jhana is that when the pleasure ceases, you get pain. And then when the pain ceases, you get pleasure and on like that. That's how pleasure works, actually. So I'm going to use, um, an, again, a mundane analogy, but try not to misapprehend this one because I don't mean this in the meditation. I'm just trying to use it to show the, the pleasure pain process of the third jhana. So it's like when you're sitting comfortably and then pain arises, so you shift because you're seeking pleasure. And so you get the pleasure when you shift. It's no longer painful. But after a while, it gets painful again. Then you have to shift to get the pleasure. So that's not happening in the meditation. You don't need to shift like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in the jhana, that process of pleasure, pain, happens like that at a mental level. So third jhana, what you see is it's still unstable. It's still fluctuating in this respect. and so. You want to go to something better. And so that's how you move to the fourth jhana. So the Bodhisattva then goes on to say, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous with the previous disappearance of joy and sadness, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. So what does this mean? What the Bodhisattva is saying here is that we don't want to experience this constant process of change, pleasure, pain, pleasure, pain, that happens with the third jhana concentration. We don't want to hold on to the pleasure that arises. Instead, we want to become more equanimous towards um, pleasure because we understand with pleasure comes pain, with pain comes pleasure and so on. So what we do at this point is we give up the pleasure, we give up the sukha, so that we can go beyond pleasure and pain. So that's why what arises then is a dukkha sukha, neither pain nor pleasure. And that is actually more stable, which is also why uh, equanimity is there. So when the bodhisattva includes the previous disappearance of joy and sadness, there's a few things we can understand from this as, as part of entering into the fourth jhana. This is a little bit more technical. So what I did was I went back into Pethical Badesa for this because it's actually talking about certain faculties that are ceasing as we go through the jhana concentrations and what we end up giving up in terms of the fourth jhana. So Pethical Badesa tells us that with the first jhana concentration, we have this faculty known as the sadness faculty, Dormanasa Indriya. So in the first jhana, that ceases. In the second jhana concentration, dukkha indriya, so the pain faculty, that ceases. And then with the third jhana, the somanasa indriya, the joy faculty ceases. And then with the fourth jhana, what we now must give up because we're giving up pleasure is that we're giving up the pleasure faculty. So the sukha indriya ceases. So what you see when you get to the fourth jhana is that all four faculties Sadness, pain, joy, pleasure, they've all ceased. And so that's why we attain equanimity with clear comprehension. So that's very technical, but it's, it's quite precise. So in many ways, you can see why the jhanas are medicine. They're medicine for these other faculties that, that make us fluctuate in our experience at the level of feeling and perception. 
So when we look at the next part, we can see, and this is also from the Pethakopadesa, it says it's due to the pleasure faculty and the joy faculty that there was unmindfulness. With the cessation of the pleasure faculty and the joy faculty, we possess mindfulness. And this is a very pure mindfulness that the Bodhisattva has. And then it's due to the pain faculty and the sadness faculty that there was the lack of clear comprehension, the more muddle-mindedness. So with their cessation, we possess the purified clear comprehension, the Sampajanya. And then with the fourth jhana, having given up pleasure and pain, we experience neither pleasure nor painful feeling and mindfulness that is purified due to equanimity. So it all comes together in the four. So the fourth jhana possesses four factors. It has equanimity, so that's the upeka, purity of the mind mindfulness, so that this is the sati parisuddhi. So it's very, very pure, this mindfulness. Neither painful nor pleasurable feeling, adukamasukha, vedana, and unification of the mind. So we still have this chitta ekagata, but it's more refined, more stable, more unshakable. So the question we again have is how do we know we've entered into the fourth jhana? So the experience of the fourth jhana is quite different from the other one because you've given up both pleasure and pain now. So for some people, it feels like their head is exposed or open. Some people have said it's open, but there's a certain lightness or non-heaviness in the head itself. There's no obvious heaviness. There's no obvious tension. It's like a weight has been lifted. And in the fourth jhana, you feel like you can't be disturbed, that anything around you is not going to pull you out of this particular concentration. Some people have described it as an empty room or a place that is very, very still. And the mind feels very, very concentrated, very alert, very luminous, and very stable. So there's nothing outside of the concentration that can grab your attention. Everything has stilled and calmed. When you remain in the fourth jhana concentration for a very long time, you can do so without much effort. And it's also, as we know, possible to go from form jhana to enter into formless attainments as well. So we've looked at formless attainments in many, many sutta meditations, and we've also looked at it in the Chula Sunyata Sutta, so we won't go through that here. And it's also possible to attain to the cessation of perception and feeling. So this is Sanya Vedeta, Sanya Vedeta Nirodha Samapati. So this arises through the development of wisdom. So uh, Bhavata Panya. And why this is important, and again, you, you can read about this in Chula Vedala Sutta, is because Mental, verbal, and physical processes cease temporarily. You get that true taste of Nibbana in Nirodha Samapati. And when you emerge from uh, Nirodha Samapati, your mind is slanting, sloping, and strongly inclining towards seclusion. So that's very, very beneficial. That means you, you get less disturbed about worldly matters, worldly things. You want to stay secluded from sensual pleasures, you, you, your preference is to stay secluded from unwholesome states or the defilements and things and misconduct. So very, very helpful if you want to complete the path. And the Chula Vedla Sutta goes into the sequence of how you enter into Nirodha Samapati and also how you um, emerge from it as well. So those are the four jhanas. I think that's all that's needed to be said about those.